When Savannah Gold went missing at the beginning of August in 2017, police asked her co-workers if they had any idea where she might be. All of them said that they didn't know what could have happened to the young woman, except one of those co-workers, Lee Rodarte, was lying. This is Monsters. Twenty-nine-year-old Lee Rodarte was the manager of the Bonefish Grill in the Mandarin neighborhood of Jacksonville, Florida. He was a Florida native who had worked at the restaurant for about five years. One of his co-workers was a server named Savannah Gold. The 21-year-old woman was born on April 26, 1996, to Dan and Sherry Gold. She grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and attended the La Villa School of Arts and then the Douglas Anderson School of Arts. Savannah turned down a scholarship to attend the Savannah College of Art and Design after high school in order to help care for her mother, who had been diagnosed with cancer. In 2017, she was living at her parents' house and had been working at the Bonefish Grill for about two years. That's where she met Lee and, though he had a girlfriend of nearly 12 years at the time, the two began spending time together outside of work. I've known her, obviously, since she worked, since she started working there. Mm -hmm. um, I would say probably about eight months ago yeah. or so, we started hanging out outside of work. Um, and at the time, I had a girlfriend. Um... But I kind of, you know, we kind of connected, me and Savannah. So we hung out a little bit here and there. Um, got pretty close. Uh, we come from, I guess, somewhat similar um, backgrounds, I guess you should say. Okay. Um, you know, she didn't have it the best come growing up, neither did I. Uh, so we kind of connected and hung out for a little while. Uh, I'd probably say a period of two three months okay um and then she started using uh drugs okay. a lot okay now i used them with her uh not the same drugs that she used all the time yeah. um but i did them with her a couple times and then she started to get heavy into them and oh gotcha okay um so i kind of just uh tried to take a step back and you know put things off, um, and after that, um, me and my ex started kind of chit-chatting again. Okay. Um, you know, and who's that? What's her name? Her name's Chelsea. Okay. All right. Um, so we kind of started chit-chatting again, never really 100% because obviously, you know, she was still kind of upset about uh, me hanging out with Savannah and stuff okay. like that. He doesn't make this clear in the interrogation, but his relationship with Savannah caused a breakup between him and his girlfriend, Chelsea. Lee claimed that Savannah was a heavy drug user, but there's no other information that backs up that claim, and the medical examiner testified that there were no drugs in her system. Lee said that her drug use was the reason he broke off his relationship with her and started getting back together with Chelsea. He claimed that after she overdosed and wound up in the hospital, Again, a claim I could find no information to back up. She got off drugs and was looking healthier. They began texting each other again, but Lee said he broke things off with her and the two parted ways mutually agreeing not to communicate outside of work. According to Lee, things didn't end so peacefully after all. I heard that she has been basically telling a lot of people at work that um, we hooked up a bunch, like couple days before that yeah. and that she was going to like tell about the whole situation and, you know try to get me fired and and why, like why would that get you fired I, 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 well I don't know. i'm a manager and she's an employee so okay I mean, it's, so it's you guys like, aren't supposed to fret and yeah. answer okay i got you. and she just told um uh people i guess that she was out with that work at the restaurant that we were having sex okay and you know hooking up and stuff like that and that i was her boyfriend and this and that um, so I was a little upset. Obviously, you know, I care about my job. Sure. Um, How long have you been there now? Uh, I'll be five years in the summer. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, so I was a little upset. Um, so I met her in the parking lot, uh, at Bonefish. When was this? Wednesday afternoon. Okay. 
What do you know what time or about? Um, it was about 5.30. Okay. Lee showed up at the restaurant at a time that he knew Savannah had a shift. When she pulled into the parking lot, he rolled down his window and asked if he could talk to her. Lee claimed that Savannah asked if she could sit in his car because she had just done heroin and was paranoid. But again, the medical examiner found no drugs in Savannah's system. Savannah climbed into the back seat of Lee's silver Chevy Malibu, and Lee got out of the driver's seat and got into the back with her. He asked her to stop telling people that they were boyfriend and girlfriend and that they were still having sex because the rumors were getting back to Chelsea and it was affecting his relationship. Apparently, Savannah didn't agree to stop telling lies, and Lee got angry. I told her that she needs to stop. Um, at that point, I got out, and I punctured the hole in the tire. Okay. Um, and I said, no, stop. Like, I'm serious. I don't want to talk to you. It's not good for us, so let's stop. And she just said, why'd you do that? Um, I said, well, I'm upset. You know, I apologized after I told her I would get her a new tire. And she said, fuck you. You know, you're a piece of shit. And I mm. said, she said she's going to keep talking, you know, telling lies and stuff about me and everything like that. And I said, don't do it again. Or next time it's going to be worse. It's going to be your windows. So, according to Lee, he got out of the car, stuck a knife into the front driver's side tire of Savannah's car, and then went back into the front seat of his car and demanded that she stop telling people they're having sex. Something he claims is a lie, but we don't know that. He might just be mad that the truth is getting back to Chelsea. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time he cheated on her. After she told him to fuck off and that she would continue to tell people whatever she wanted, he demanded that she got out of his car, which, in this version of events, she does. Savannah never started her shift, and at about 6 p.m., her father received an error-laden text message that read, quote, Hey, I just wanted to tell you and Mom I met a really great guy and we're running away together. I love him and we are leaving tonight. I'll call you later when we get to where we're going. End quote. Her brother, Chris Gold, also received a similarly sloppy message that read, quote, Hey, I quit. I'm leaving with my boyfriend. I can't do this shit anything. Probably meant any more. I'm fine. Just want to get away. End quote. Savannah's family immediately knew that she hadn't sent those text messages. She didn't talk like that in text messages, and she would never send messages filled with that many spelling errors. They also knew that the young woman wouldn't put on her work uniform, leave to start a shift, and then blow off her employer to run away with some unnamed boy. This was the same girl who had turned down a scholarship to art school so she could care for her sick mother. I know that kids have secrets from their parents. I sure did. But none of Savannah's friends or family members said that that sounded like her. When the restaurant called her parents' house after she hadn't shown up to her shift, Dan and Sherry decided it was time to call the police. When police arrived at the parking lot of the Bonefish Grill, they saw Savannah's 2007 Kia Spectra and found it unlocked with a flat tire. Her wallet and ID were in the car, but Savannah had disappeared. Since the text messages to her father and brother, she hadn't used her phone and she hadn't been on social media. Investigators questioned the employees at the restaurant, but nobody had seen Savannah. The manager, Lee, said that he hadn't seen Savannah in two to three weeks. He even helped the family pass out missing persons flyers. In the meantime, investigators were scrambling to find any clue as to where Savannah could have gone. They scoured the area and were lucky to find a surveillance camera that pointed right at the parking lot where Savannah's car had been parked. As they scrubbed through the footage, they saw a silver Chevy Malibu pull into the parking lot a few minutes before Savannah arrived in her Kia Spectra. Savannah got out of her car, spent a few minutes talking to someone inside the car before getting into the back seat. The driver exited the car and followed Savannah into the back seat. At one point, the driver got out, went over to the Kia, and slashed a tire. Then he got back into the back seat of the Chevy. Suddenly, the Malibu started rocking and you could see someone kick the back door open three times before the driver got out, 
opened the door to the Kia, grabbed something, got back into the driver's seat of the Chevy, and drove away. Savannah had never exited that silver Chevy Malibu. After a little digging, it was discovered that Bonefish Grill manager Lee Radarte owned a silver Chevy Malibu that matched the car in the video. Detectives went down to the restaurant and pulled him out of the middle of his shift so he could come down to the station for questioning. This is where Lee's story changed for the first time. He admitted that he had lied about the last time he had seen Savannah and told them the story about arguing with her in the parking lot. According to Lee, after he punctured her tire, she got out of his car and ended up getting into a green, mid-90s Ford pickup. He said it looked like she used her phone, and about five minutes later, the pickup truck pulled into the parking lot. She got into the truck, and they drove off. He said the windows were tinted, so all he could really see was a baseball cap, but couldn't see a face. He couldn't even tell if it was a man or a woman who was driving. The investigators don't understand why he wouldn't have told them about Savannah getting into a green truck the first time they talked to him. But you know she's been missing. I mean, you, you knew from, you know, from, in essence, from day one that she is, um, that she's missing. And you, um, you, you freaked out that, I mean, you had I just, to know. I mean, point. obviously, you know, I was the last one to see her. So yeah. I was a little bit scared at that. Um... And How do you know you're, you you just said you weren't the last one to see her. You just said a, somebody in a truck. Well, I mean, the last one to see her at Bonefish. Okay. That the last one she's heard from. Right. I had contact with that anybody knows of. Sure. Um, and, you know, I thought that I had a warrant out already. Okay. Um, What's the warrant for? Uh, I didn't go to a court date for a ticket. Okay. Okay. So, obviously, but I, I didn't. I talked to you last night. Yeah. And I didn't have handcuffs. I didn't wasn't threatening in any way. Definitely not. And I, but I and mean, I, and I left. So I mean, what were you? You were worried. If you were worried, you were going to get arrested. Then that would have happened. Well, I mean, that's another reason that uh, you know, I Chelsea called me and I said, you know, I told him I didn't, you know, know anything. What do I do now? You know, I already. When did you talk already, to Chelsea about that? When did you when did you talk to her? Um, about that you talked, it had to have been after last night. So was yeah. it today? No, I didn't talk to her today. His timeline is falling apart. He claimed that he had talked to Chelsea and told her that he told the police that he didn't know anything, and she encouraged him to tell the police about what he had seen. The detective had just talked to Lee the night before at around 11 p.m., so if Lee hadn't had this conversation with Chelsea after that, then the timeline didn't add up. So you said that you told her that you had talked to us, but I, I don't think that that could chronologically. I don't think that could match. No, up. Okay. we we talked Thursday. Okay, and not last night. No, we talked. Or we, this. We we talked Thursday. Okay, after like uh, her mom and everything was on the news. Yeah, um, she called me and was like, "Hey, you know, everything's all over the news. Uh, you need to you need to tell somebody. You know." She said, call the hotline or something like that. Did you call the hotline? Um, I told her I did just because I had, I wasn't, I was scared to call that night. So, but did you ever call the hotline? No. His story shifts, so now he didn't specifically tell Chelsea that he told the police he didn't know anything. Now he claims that they saw Savannah was missing on the news, and Chelsea was encouraging him to call the information hotline, which he didn't, of course. At this point, Lee doesn't know that they have the incident captured on surveillance video. They aren't buying his story because they know for a fact it isn't true. They watched Savannah get into his car and never get back out. So tell attention. me how I go from, nice guy, never met you, um, you seem like a nice guy, I come up and talk to you, uh, again, out of, you know, you agreed that there was nothing threatening or anything about our conversation, just asking you for some, some basic, simple things where we talked for just a few minutes, and you um, didn't tell me this story. I'm not going to say the truth, because um, I, I think there's holes in this story, too. Okay. Um, so you don't tell me this story, and then today we're talking again, because I brought you down to talk to you because I found holes in, in that story that didn't match up. And now you're telling me another story 
that there's holes in this story that does not match up. So where where's Savannah? I don't know. The detective finally just comes out and blindsides Lee with, where's Savannah? No lead up, no, well, we have surveillance and we saw this or we found this evidence that proves this. Just your story doesn't add up, so where's Savannah? And Lee still doesn't know there's surveillance footage of him. He just holds his ground and plays dumb. I don't know. She took off in that truck and I haven't seen her since. We'll be right back. The detectives ask Lee what Chelsea thinks about his story. Lee says he doesn't know, but the detectives do. Um, just so you know, Chelsea thinks you're bullshit, okay? Because we've talked, we've talked to a lot yeah. of people. So, and, and, and I mean, that's about the gist of, you know, Chelsea's attitude towards me for the most part for the past months. You know, okay. Ever since me and Savannah. Is that because first, you're a liar? I mean, to her, like in I the mean, past? That's pretty much what she labels me as, yeah. Do you, because do you I, lie? Not about, every, no. I mean, obviously I lied to her about okay. hanging out with Savannah and stuff And you like lied that. to me about Savannah. Yes, sir. Okay. So, I mean, I, I just, I'm not trying to say anything. No, I, mean, I understand. Here's, I'm just laying out a, a facts here. I want, I want to find this girl. I, I need to find her. I understand. Um, and here's a couple reasons I need to find her. One is um, I'm hoping that, that she's still alive. Um, and, and that's really, I, I really do, I'm holding out for that. Um, and if she's not alive, then I think she and her family are, are, are due that knowledge. I think Pleasure. that's, uh, I think they need some closure. Um, because I think the reality is, is if somebody's, you know, dead somewhere, a, a parent would want to know. I, I think if you, do you have kids? No. Okay. So it, one day when you have kids, you, w the uncertainty is, is, Whatever kind of a person she is, and I'm not about to say what kind of a person she is, um, because that, I, I'm not making any judgments. I'm saying that this human being is, if she's alive, then I, I want to find her. I, I need to make sure she's okay, because several days now, she hasn't been around. Some there, Things happen to the human body, and people can't stand um, a, a lot of things that can transpire. But the other thing is, if she's not, this family deserves better than this. This family deserves better than somebody who works with her and who's got knowledge and won't tell the police because they're worried about their own ass. Because that's pretty I, that's, that's pretty cheap. I'm gonna be honest with you. And I agree, your I your guess. feelings in it, I don't I don't really care about your feelings. What I care about is finding her. So where is she? I don't know where she is. Where is Savannah? I don't know. I need to know where Savannah is. So I, I don't let know her where know. she is. When you have kids, <laughs> I guarantee you that Lee is never having kids. The detectives finally drop the bombshell that they have the entire incident on video and inform Lee that they know that Savannah never got out of his car in the parking lot. He continues to deny it, and I feel like he thinks they're lying at first, but they talk about things that happened in the video, and eventually Lee realizes that he's fucked. So he changed his story again. Because if there's one thing we all know, if the first two stories you tell the cops don't work, Telling a third version of events will definitely make you look innocent. I don't know where she is. Okay, then where did you last drop her off at? I didn't drop her off. Okay, well then tell me. What happened? Where'd you guys go? We went to my house. Okay. We did some jokes. Okay. Hung out for a little. And then she said she was going to catch an Uber home. Okay. And did she call an Uber? She pulled her phone out, looked like she was using it. I wasn't hovering over her. I was pretty high. So, I mean, I wasn't, she told me she was leaving. She walked out the door. They did some drugs together, except they didn't because the medical examiner found no drugs in her system. Then she left in an Uber. At what point do you think to yourself, hmm, maybe continually changing my story will make me look more guilty? Of course, the detectives knew that's also not what happened because you could see a struggle happening in the back seat on the surveillance footage. What was going on in the back seat? What was going on in the back seat? For the doors to be kicked open. She kicked open that door three times, Lee. She kicked it. We saw it. And you know, and you know I'm not making it up because I wouldn't know this because I wasn't there. I would never know this unless we had video of it, correct? Yes, correct. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just a fact finder. We're not going to lie to you. 
That door kicked over three times. Obviously something went on in that back seat. Don't tell me about that. What happened in the back seat? Did she get mad at you? I mean, she was upset. Yeah. She tried to slap me. I slapped her. She went to get out. I grabbed her around her waist and said, where are you going? Why are you hitting me? And she tried to slap me again. And then, you know, I was still holding her and she calmed down and we left. We talked and we left. Any man that grabs a woman as she's trying to leave and pulls her back and says, quote, where are you going, end quote, is one, not a good person, and two, not in fear of their life. That becomes important later. He finally bites the bullet and admits that he killed Savannah. He describes exactly what happened. She leaned over and like went around me. Okay. And just like squeezed. Okay. Around your chest or your neck or something? It was kind of like mid. Okay. She's just like, like that. Yeah. She's trying to, oh, like that, like trying to. Like halfway up my chest. Yeah. Okay. And just like kind of on the back of my neck. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I tried to pull away and she wouldn't. Okay. So I took my hands and. Moved her hands and, away? I moved. I tried to move her away. Okay. And I thought my hands were around her shoulders. Okay. My hands were around her neck. Okay. And I turned and went. I went to push her down onto the seat. Okay. But my hands were around her neck. Okay. I thought I had her right here. You thought you had her up here? Yeah, I thought okay. I had her like. Like right here. Yeah. And I ended up coming down. Okay. And I just heard a pop. Okay, you heard a pop sound? Okay. And she just... And you had both hands like this around, like around this part of her neck? Did, could you feel a pop? Yeah. Okay, where did you feel it? I just heard it, and then it felt like somewhere in here. Okay. And um, when you after you heard the pop, what um, what what happened at that point? Do you remember? She just stopped moving. Okay. He claims that he was just trying to get her to let go of him, but it's clear from the surveillance video and other statements Lee made during his interrogation that Savannah was trying to get away from him. After killing Savannah, Lee jumped out of the back seat and went over to the Kia where he grabbed a makeup bag. He told detectives that he didn't know why he took it, but I think he wanted to make it look like she left with her mysterious boyfriend. He got back into the driver's seat of his car and drove away. He texted Savannah's father and brother before throwing her phone out the window. At his house, he pulled Savannah out of his car and brought her into his backyard where he had a fire pit. He took off her work uniform and put her body in the fire pit. He tried to burn Savannah's body, but it didn't work the way he thought it would. People underestimate the amount of time it takes to fully burn a human body. He was trying to get rid of the body before his roommate got home, so when the body didn't burn fast enough, he took her out of the fire pit and buried her in his backyard. Crime scene investigators found gas cans and an empty bleach bottle at his house. Two days later, on August 4th, the police arrived at the restaurant to question the employees. The encounter freaked Lee out, so the following morning, he dug up Savannah's body, wrapped her in plastic and a blanket, and put her in the trunk of his car. He drove to a pond where he would regularly go fishing and dumped her body. He also threw her clothes out of the car as he was driving down the highway. At about 7.15 that evening, the police brought Lee in for questioning, where he had finally confessed to the murder and told authorities where he had disposed of Savannah's body. Lee Rodarte was charged with second-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and abuse of a dead body. Even though he confessed to the crime, he pleaded not guilty. 
He filed a stand-your-ground motion, claiming that he feared for his life and that Savannah's death was self-defense. The stand-your-ground law is a Florida law that says that any death caused by someone who was in fear of their life would be considered self-defense. It made national headlines when George Zimmerman used it successfully after he shot and killed Trayvon Martin. The law is a good thing in theory. People shouldn't be too afraid to defend themselves out of the possibility of catching a murder charge. Unfortunately, it's created a situation where every murderer claims that they were in fear of their life and tries to get their charges dropped. Fortunately, it's not as black and white as just saying, I feared for my life, and the court lets you go. They do consider the circumstances, and the circumstances surrounding Savannah's death did not add up to self-defense. First, Lee was 5 foot 11 inches, weighing 163 pounds, while Savannah was 5 foot even, weighing 91 pounds. I'm sorry, but unless she was a trained ninja assassin, she was not overpowering him. It also didn't help that he said in his interrogation that she tried to leave and he pulled her back saying, where are you going? That doesn't sound like someone who's in fear for their life. His claim was that she had her hands around his neck, and he had his hands around hers, trying to get her to let go of him. He somehow fell on top of her and then heard a pop, and she stopped moving. His assertion was that he accidentally broke her neck while he was fighting for his life against his drug-fueled ex-girlfriend. Unfortunately for Lee, the medical examiner said she didn't have a broken neck, and, of course, she had no drugs in her system. He said there was cartilage in Savannah's thyroid that was fractured, but her spinal cord was undamaged. He said the damage to the thyroid cartilage could be evidence of strangulation, but it was definite that nothing in her neck broke, causing her to die immediately. It was most likely she was strangled to death, which would have taken four to five minutes. The court denied the stand-your-ground motion, as did an appeals court. Lee was then offered a deal to plead guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for 40 years in prison. Lee accepted the deal. Lee Rodarte had no history of violence prior to the murder of Savannah Gold, but maybe murder just ran in the family. It turns out that Lee's sister, 26-year-old Amber Camarillo, was arrested in 2016 after shooting and killing a woman named Raquel Wallace at a motel in Jacksonville. It seems that one of Amber's friends took her car, a Honda Civic, and traded it to Raquel in exchange for drugs. Nice friend. Amber eventually tracked down the car to Raquel, and the two planned to meet in the parking lot of a Super 8 motel so the car could be returned to its owner. At the meeting, Raquel demanded $100 for the return of the car, so Amber shot her twice before fleeing the scene. Raquel made it back to the motel room she was staying in before dying. Like Savannah's murder, this incident was also caught on surveillance and Amber confessed to the crime as soon as the police arrived at her house. What a family. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.